In the world of Warhammer 40k, the Astra Militarum, or Imperial Guard, are the most powerful fighting force in the galaxy. And the image of millions of individual human soldiers, supported by long columns of battle tanks and brutal artillery, deployed against every horror the galaxy can throw at them, is one of the key things we think of when we imagine the Imperium. So in this video, I'm going to look into the lore of the Astra Militarum, their history, how they fight, how they're organised, and what a new recruit to the Imperial Guard can expect from a gruelling life in the armies of the Emperor. The Astra Militarum is the standing army of the Imperium of Man, a force numbering in the billions and present in every major engagement the Imperium fights. Compared to the scalpel that is the rapid reaction forces of the Space Marine chapters, the Astra Militarum is known as the Hammer of the Emperor, a ponderous, unwieldy force that may be slow to react, but when it does, comes crashing down with the weight of millions of soldiers and thousands of tons of munitions. Its armies include include elite special units and exotic arms and armour, but its key resource is human lives, taken from every planet in the Imperium to fight and die in the name of their Emperor, and spent, sometimes without a thought, by the Lord Generals and Lord High Commanders of the Imperium. The Astra Militarum wins its battles by relentless pressure, as regiment after regiment is poured into a war zone, often overcoming an enemy through attrition alone, for the Imperium of 40k is never short of manpower. Though just unmodified humans armed with las guns and clad in flak armour, soldiers of the Astra Militarum are deployed against Xenos horrors, unspeakable war entities, chaos worshipping cults, and heretic space marines, and expected to hold their ground. Their infantry platoons spurred on by skilled officers and the ever-present threat of their commissars waiting to execute any who turn from their holy duty. These infantry platoons are then backed by some of the heaviest arms and armour the Imperium can produce. Liman Ross and Rogaldorn battle tanks, Basilisk and Medusa artillery pieces, Valkyrie gunships and super heavies like the Baneblade and Shadow Sword. Manufactured and deployed in vast columns of armour to war zones across the galaxy, these vehicles aren't the pinnacle of Imperial technology like the battle tanks of the Space Marines, but just extremely long-lived and rugged designs that can be built in huge numbers and repaired on campaign. The regiments that make up this force are drawn from across the galaxy, from the hives of Mordian and Vostroya, to the death worlds of Katachin and Valhalla, to the arid deserts of Talan. Organising and supplying such a force is one of the biggest logistical efforts the Imperium undertakes. The command structure of the Guard stretches all the way to the very top of the Imperial hierarchy, with no less than three of the twelve High Lords of Terror being responsible for it in some way. The Departmento Munitorum, the organisation that exists to organise and supply all this, is a behemoth, raising, supplying and reinforcing millions of regiments across the galaxy at any one time in an operation that occupies whole planets worth of scribes and clerks. In the 41st millennium, the Imperial Guard is by far the biggest and most important of the Imperium's armed forces, but for many of the founding years of the Imperium, it didn't really exist. The history of the Astra Militarum as an organisation starts during the Scouring, as the Imperium was reorganised in the wake of the colossal civil war that was the Horus Heresy. Unaugmented human troops had always been part of the Emperor's armies, from the earliest days during the unification of Terra to the expansion out into the galaxy known as the Great Crusade, but they were often eclipsed in glory by genetically modified soldiers, the Custodes, Thunder Warriors and later the Space Marines of the Legiones Astartes. Together, these human forces were known as the Imperial Army, but it was actually a number of different armies, regiments and battalions that could be incredibly diverse in their organisation and operation. The famed Old Hundred, the Terran armies that allied with and served the Emperor during the unification of Earth, comprised such famous names as the elite Lucifer Blacks, the gene-bred regiments of the Gino Chiliads, or exotic robo-cavalry like the Tupolov Lancers, each totally different in their methods and equipment. 
equipment. As the Crusades spread out across the galaxy and re-established contact with human worlds, even more human armies were added, levied from newly compliant worlds as they all became part of the Imperium. At this point, there was neither the infrastructure nor the time for any sort of standardization. These regiments were raised quickly and immediately assigned to expeditionary fleets, each a self-reliant army group with its own naval assets, air support, diplomats, architects, historians, and everything else required to affect compliance of a newly encountered civilization. These fleets were often led by the legions, like the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, commanded by the Warmaster Horus and comprising much of the Sons of Horus Legion's strength. They were supported by the human armies of the Byzant Janazars, who were mostly relegated to garrisoning conquered worlds and mopping up pockets of resistance after the spear tip of the legion had moved on. But the legions couldn't be everywhere, and many expeditionary fleets were just groupings of human troops with minimal Astarte support. The 670th Expeditionary Fleet, led by Lord Commander Teng Namat Jira, included regiments from the Regnaut Thorns, the Geno 52 Chiliad, the Zanzibari Hort, the Crescent Sin 6th Turrent, and many more with extremely limited Astarte support. These combined armed self-sufficient forces were invaluable during the Crusade, but they proved to be a liability as the Horus heresy spread across the galaxy. It wasn't just the nine traitor Space Marine legions that turned upon the Emperor, but also their attendant army units. The heresy stretched from the highest Primarch down to the lowest impressed army trooper. If a fleet commander turned to the side of Horus, he brought with him an entire mobile battle group with multiple regiments attached. And so, as the ashes of the heresy settled and the remnants of Horus's traitor forces were hounded into the Eye of Terror during the scouring, Robert Gearman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, enacted sweeping changes to how the Imperium's armed forces operated so that no one commander could hold on to so much power ever again. The regular armed forces of the Imperium were split into the Imperial Navy and the Imperial Guard, formerly known as the Astra Militarum, under the command of the Departmento Munitorum, which itself was a part of the new Administratum of Terror, the Imperial Bureaucracy. The Departmento was actually devised in the latter days of the Great Crusade in an attempt to manage the chaotic organisation of the Imperial Army, but now it would be responsible for the raising, maintaining, deployment and supply of these new regiments of the Astra Militarum. As well as this split from the fleets, the new regiments of the Astra Militarum would be divided up by role, with regiments of infantry, artillery, armour, or anything else kept separate, with very limited combined arms capabilities. Any future traitors or rogue commanders would be limited not only by the sorts of troops at their disposal, they'd need multiple regiments turning to prosecute any sort of war, but also by a lack of interplanetary travel. So successful were these reforms that the system remained in place with minimal changes for 10,000 years. In the 41st millennium, every planet in the Imperium is expected to manage its own local affairs under the rule of its planetary governor, but each planet is also assigned a tithe by the administratum, the colossal bureaucracy of the Imperium. This tithe could be anything from food destined for overpopulated hive worlds, to raw materials destined for manufacturing planets or forge worlds, to industrial output, a quota of finished products, often weapons or machinery of war. But frequently, some some part of the tithe is extracted in the form of fighting warriors, regiments for the Astra Militarum. In fact, on some worlds like Krieg or Cadia, fighting warriors are the main tithed element. And while tithes can remain the same for thousands of years, they could always be reviewed and adjusted based on local developments. Nearby Xenos activity, unrest or new incursions might see additional demands for manpower added to a planet's tithe, but whatever the reason, as soon as a military contribution is required, it becomes the departmento Unitorum's job to organise the raising of these new regiments, their supply, collection and then deployment to wherever they're headed. Where the manpower for these regiments comes from varies depending on the planet. Every world in the Imperium is expected to raise and maintain its own local armies, known as Planetary Defence Forces, or PDF, to keep peace, prevent rebellion, defend the planet against pirates or raiders, and form the first line of defence against, well, anything bigger. So every planet already has some form of standing army, but the quality of that PDF can vary greatly. Hive worlds or industrial worlds like Mordian might have large enough 
efficient PDFs, armed and equipped much like the Astra Militarum itself. But a backwater farming planet might rely on a small citizen militia using ancient heirloom LAS rifles. And feral worlds might have warriors with an even lower technological level. Regardless, one of the most common ways of raising new Imperial Guard is to draw them from a planet's standing PDF. Imperial worlds have a responsibility to make 10% of their armed forces available for induction at any time, with often the most elite or prestigious regiments transferred into the Imperial Guard and put under the command of the Departmento. But it's equally likely that new foundings will be held, as required, with the manpower supplied by any means necessary. From glorious founding ceremonies of new volunteers, as with the Gudronite rifles, to conscription impression, or even the clearing out of undesirables. Though a planetary governor who chooses to fulfil his quota to the departmento with, say, convict troops, had better be pretty sure they're going to make good soldiers lest he be considered remiss in his holy duty to the Imperium. Also, while some planets in the Imperium are exempt from this tithe, like Space Marine Homeworlds or Adeptus Mechanicus Forge Worlds, that doesn't mean they don't sometimes maintain their own defence forces anyway, and even occasionally send regiments to the Astra Militar Ultramar in the Galactic East is a famously efficient example of a space marine realm and contributes regiments to the Imperial Guard, as does the Forge World of Erdesh, a linchpin of the Sabat World's Crusade. What sorts of regiments are raised when a new founding is called is determined by the Departmento, but often, like in the old Imperial Army, the particulars of the planet in question play a role in determining what sort of regiments they supply. The Hive World of Armageddon's colossal toxic ash wastes produce famed mecha regiments. The Tanith first and only are peerless light infantry and scouts due to their homeworld's dense moving forests, and the system of Elysia where the local PDF are engaged constantly against the pirates lurking in their system's gas clouds and moons produces elite airborne drop troopers. But though planets might be famous for one particular kind of regiment, that doesn't mean that's all they supply. The death world of Katachan might be famous for its jungle fighter guerrilla infantry regiments, but it still produces artillery regiments and tank regiments and worlds like Brimlock, Krieg or Cadia produce almost every sort of regiment known to man. The intention with this system is to make sure that any given regiment is a self-enclosed unit that's roughly the same level of military might as any other regiment, so that the Departmento can assess the threat level in a given war zone and then commit a certain number of appropriate regiments to it from nearby sources. For example, during the first Taros campaign, when the Imperium attempted to retake the desert world of Taros from the invading Tau Empire, the Lord Marshal de Stale was supplied with 10 regiments. Five were from the desert world of Talarn, thought to be particularly suitable for the conflict. Four infantry regiments and one armoured regiment, either pulled from other duties or newly founded. The other five were more varied. The 23rd Elysian drop troops able to rapidly redeploy across the desert wastes. A unit of Serenian assault engineers, heavy infantry for the expected urban fighting at the end of the campaign. The mechanised 114th Cadian shock troops in their Chimera transports, the 8th Brimlock Dragoons who had recent experience fighting the Tau, and finally the 19th Krieg Armoured who were just nearby and on garrison duty and thus available for the campaign. As we said, the intention here is that each regiment is roughly equal in terms of effectiveness, but in reality regiments can vary drastically in size and power and in organisational structure. An infantry regiment might be anywhere between a few thousand to a few hundred thousand soldiers. And though they're nominally commanded by a colonel and split down into first companies and then platoons, the exact ranks used, the number and size of companies and the adoption of other organisational units like battalions all depends on the regiment. One thing that is slightly more uniform is equipment. For the Departmento Munitorum, supplying multiple war fronts at once, standardised weapons, armour and ammunition is a huge benefit. A new recruit to the Imperial Guard can be expected to be issued with some form of flak armour, layers of ballistic materials that provide basic battlefield protection, and a LAS gun, the most reliable and widely produced weapon in the Imperium, as well as standardised sidearms, clothing and of course devotional texts like the Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer. There is of course still some variation here. There are numerous different patterns of LAS guns, some of which are favoured by particular worlds, but at the technical level if something can be standardised by the departmento, 
it is. The newly raised regiment will be transferred into the holds and troop bays of Imperial Navy ships, ready to begin its journey to its assigned war zone. For the individual soldiers, it's unlikely they'll ever see their home world again. All they have to look forward to is a lifetime of war in the Emperor's name, and occasional stretches of drilling and training on the long journeys between conflicts, if they ever make it past the first one. They could be assigned to a sleepy garrison post on a distant world, or into the teeth of a gruelling decades-long war where the life expectancy for new arrivals is as low as 15 minutes. In the holds of these transport ships, a series of endless drills and training exercises begins, both to hone their skills and bring them up to the standard expected of the Imperial Guard, but also to keep them occupied and minimise friction between unfamiliar regiments from different worlds cooped up together for months at a time. Watching over all this will be the officers of the Departmento Munitorum itself, the commissars of the Officio Perfectus, charged with maintaining discipline in the ranks and ensuring the regiment follows its orders. Each regiment is assigned at least one commissar, often more, and they're never from the same world as the rest of the regiment. Their role is not only to deal with day-to-day -day discipline and morale issues, but to ensure that both the private soldiers and the officers are fulfilling their duties. How they do this varies from commissar to commissar. Some are firebrands, almost preachers, encouraging the guardsmen from the front lines. Others are more like advisors and counsellors to the senior staff of the regiment but all of them have the power of life and death over any guardsman of any rank found disobeying orders, hesitating or deserting, or just being incompetent, and the commissariat is never above setting an encouraging example through the use of a judicious field execution. The Astra Militarum also maintains numerous specialist departments and organisations that exist outside the normal structure, often trained or supplied in collaboration with other organisations within the Imperium. The Scholastica Psychana, part of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica, trains sanctioned battle psychers for use by frontline regiments, either as sanctioned weird vein psychers operating in groups to harass the enemy, or as Primaris battle psychers, advising guard commanders and fighting on the front lines. The elite Tempestus Scion Stormtroopers regiments are a blend of heavy infantry and special forces, wearing carapace armour and armed with hotshot las guns, and deployed on critical missions behind the lines or to spearhead an assault. Some line regiments maintain their own similar heavy infantry, known as Grenadiers, but the Tempestus Scions, trained from childhood in the Scholar Pregenium of the Adeptus Ministorum, are the best of the best. The Astra Militarum also raises regiments of abhumans, stable mutants considered acceptable for service in the Emperor's name. Hugely muscled Ogrins are recruited from feral worlds, armed with simple ripper guns or brutal mauls, and assigned to back up various regiments on the line. And on the other end of the spectrum, the diminutive Ratlings serve as specialist scouts or snipers, able to infiltrate further inland than a regular guardsman. In addition to this, other, more specialised regiments might find themselves split up and assigned as fire support, so an infantry company might find itself going into war alongside Limanros battle tanks, scout sentinels from a recon detachment, or Hydra flak batteries assigned to it for the duration of a campaign. By the time our new infantry regiment reaches its first war zone, it might be a very different formation from the one that left its homeworld. Our few thousand new recruits, trained for months in the bellies of the transport craft, are thrown into the front lines, barely aware of what war they're fighting, given orders by their captains and colonels, encouraged forwards by shouting commissars, fighting alongside monstrous ogrins or elite stormtroopers, and supported by massed armour or artillery elements detached from other regiments, and along the line will be hundreds more unfamiliar regiments, just like them but drawn from all the diverse worlds of the Imperium. Coordinating all this is a complex structure of command staff, from the generals, marshals and lord commanders in charge of all the regiments assigned to a particular war zone, to the war masters who have overall command of all forces assigned to a significant endeavour like a crusade, and from there to the lord commanders segmentum, the lord ultima or lord solar in charge of the military for an entire quarter of the Imperium. And above them all is the Lord Commander Militant of the Astra Militarum, one of the High Lords of Terror. In overall logistical command of every regiment fighting on every war front in the Imperium. If those regiments survive their first conflict, they'll just be redeployed again and again into war zone after war zone, a resource for the unending machine of the Imperium. 
Reinforcement from a regiment's homeworld is generally considered logistically impossible, so they'll just be whittled down over the years to a core of veteran troops. Below a certain strength, regiments might be combined with other understrength units, forming ad hoc companies, or new regiments entirely, sometimes from the same homeworld, as in the case of the 597th Val Hallen, and sometimes by specialism, as with the case of the 81st Belladon and the Tanith First combined to form the 81st First Recon during the Sabbath about World's Crusade. Regiments with even fewer survivors might be disbanded altogether. If they're lucky, the survivors of some great victory might be granted rights of settlement over a new imperial world, but in reality this is so rare as to be a myth, the jaded veterans being abandoned wherever the war front happens to leave them, whether that's in the same system they were raised to defend, or light years away on the other side of the galaxy, left to their own devices to ply whatever trade they have remaining, and veteran guardsmen are an occasional sight in ports or under hives across the galaxy. The Astra Militarum is the greatest war machine humanity has ever conceived, a meat grinder designed to crush the enemies of the Imperium with overwhelming numbers, ingesting whole generations of Imperial citizens from all over the galaxy, stamping them into the most simple of moulds and throwing them into a lifetime of combat against every horror the galaxy can throw at them, armed with little more than a lasgun and their own fear of what will happen should they turn their backs. It comprises elite special forces and barely trained conscripts, colossal artillery formations and fast-moving tank battalions, drawn from a million worlds with a million cultures. But to the administrators of the Departmento Munitorum and the Lord Generals of High Command, they're all just numbers. Resources to be spent to ensure that humanity dominates the stars in a world where the life of an individual guardsman, to quote the rulebook, will not be missed. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like more lore videos about 40k, well, there's probably one just coming up there to the right. And if you'd like to support the channel, please like, subscribe, and there's a link to the Patreon in the thing below. See ya.